Jesus. What a powerful name. We think about Jesus in many different ways. We think about Jesus as our Savior, somebody who rescues us from our sins, our shame, our guilt. We think about Jesus as our healer, someone who heals our brokenness. We think about Jesus as a teacher who teaches us how to live a better life. But what if I told you that Jesus is a leader of a movement? You see, on Easter morning, when Jesus came back to life and defeated sin and death once and for all, Jesus became the leader of a movement. It's a worldwide movement. It's a movement that has been changing people's lives for centuries. It's a movement that many of us are a part of today. It's a movement that we call Christianity. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I think the word Christianity has a lot of baggage with it today. And I think a lot of that baggage comes from Christians, which is supposed to mean little Christ, followers of Jesus, imitators of Christ. A lot of Christians have acted in some really non-Christ-like ways. And when that keeps happening, Christianity has kind of gotten a bad name in society. But this morning, I'm wondering if we can reclaim some of the goodness of the Christian movement by going back to the beginning of where this movement began. And so today we are beginning a new sermon series titled Acts of Movement, where we're going to talk about the start of the church and the Christian movement. So, to begin today, I actually want to begin with a TED Talk video. Uh, some of you might have seen TED Talk videos before where there's experts give a talk about really any topic. And so this one is about how to start a movement. So let's watch this clip to begin this So ladies and gentlemen, at TED, we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen, start to finish, in under three minutes, and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> and here comes the second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and the crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. And here come two more people, and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so, notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out. They won't be ridiculed, but they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So, <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So, first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over-glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy who was first, and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that for Ted. Thanks. <laughs> so now we know all how to go out and start a dance party movement, right? 
But I think, what if we applied some of what Derek was talking about and apply it to Jesus and the start of the Christian movement? Derek says that we can't all be leaders. That would be really ineffective. But he talks about the power in being a follower. Derek said, if you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and follow. Now, let me just be perfectly clear this morning. I am not suggesting that Jesus is a lone nut. I'm not suggesting that. But what I am suggesting is that there is incredible power in being a follower, especially a follower of Jesus. And so today, we are going to begin looking at the book of Acts, who was written by an early follower of Jesus. This early follower of Jesus was probably not actually alive to witness Jesus when he lived and walked around on earth, but this early follower of Jesus knew people who had seen Jesus. That's how close he was to connected to Jesus in Jesus' time on earth. And so we are going to look at this man's credible witness to the life and the power of Jesus and the star of the Christian movement. So if you have your Bibles with you, or I invite you to pull one out from the back of the pew in front of you and turn to the book of Acts. We're going to begin reading Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Acts is in the New Testament, so you want to flip past Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you'll find the book of Acts. And so the book of Acts begins in this way, verse 1. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. This book begins by saying that it's dedicated to a man named Theophilus. Now, we don't know much about this guy. We know that his name means a friend or a lover of God, and many people think that he was maybe a Roman official. But this book is dedicated to this man named Theophilus. Interestingly enough, Acts is not the only book in the New Testament that's dedicated to Theophilus. The Gospel of Luke begins in this way. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of events that have been fulfilled among us, just as we have been handed on to us by those who, from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and servants to the word. I, too, decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. Both the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts are dedicated to this man named Theophilus. And what that means is that whoever wrote the Gospel of Luke also wrote the Book of Acts. You can think of them as like a two-volume set. Luke is volume one, Acts is volume two, or Acts is the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. It gets interrupted in our Bibles because we've intersected John in between Luke and Acts, but you should really read them as one work where this follower of Jesus records what Jesus said and did, and then records the start of the Christian movement. And so let's continue reading in Acts chapter 1. Let's pick up in verse 3. After Jesus' suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with his disciples, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. Jesus, after suffering on the cross and coming back to life, spent a period of 40 days with his disciples, his first followers. And he was instructing them about the kingdom of God. He was telling them there's a different way to live. That you don't have to live in the kingdom of this world that seems to be marked by hatred and anger and jealousy and competition. Jesus says, no, 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 there's a different way to live. The kingdom of God is marked by life and love and hope and joy and peace. And this is the life that I have come to offer you. That is why I went through the cross and came back to life to offer you this abundant life now and forever. And so Jesus was teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God for 40 days. And after that period of 40 days,
three days, I would think, like, Jesus would be like, okay, guys, let's come together, let's have our final exam, and I'm going to see how well you've done listening to my teaching. And then if you pass the final, then I'll say, you've mastered the kingdom of God, go out and tell others about the kingdom of God, and start the Christian movement. But that's not what Jesus did. Instead, Jesus called his disciples together and told them to wait, to wait for the promise of the Father. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really like waiting. I'm a bit of an impatient person. I really don't like waiting, especially for good things. So I can relate to Ian. Ian's birthday, said he says this week. Mine was this past week. My birthday was on Thursday. And so I had to wait all week to celebrate my birthday. And to kind of add to the anticipation, these little Amazon packages kept, like, showing up outside my door. And I knew that they had birthday presents in them. But I couldn't open them until Thursday. I knew they had birthday presents because my husband Chris called and said, Hannah, I sent your birthday packages to the house, but you can't open them until Thursday. So it was like agonizing, you know, to bring in the Amazon packages, but to have to wait till Thursday to open them. But this is what Jesus is telling his disciples, wait to receive the gift, the promise of the Father. And if the disciples were like me, they wanted to probably like pay for like overnight shipping so that the gift from the Father could have arrived uh, instantly, right? The next day, that's probably what they wanted. But instead, Jesus said, wait. And I think this applies in our lives because sometimes do we miss the gifts of God in our lives because we're rushing around, working on our own timelines, and not trusting and waiting for God to work in our lives? How often do we miss God's gifts and work in our lives because we refuse to wait. Whenever I think about this in my own life, I often cling to this prayer written by one of the early saints of the church, Pierre Tillard. And he writes this prayer. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without <coughs> delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability and that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on as though you could be today what time, that is to say grace and circumstances, acting on your own goodwill, will make you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. That we are to trust in the slow work of God and to wait to receive the good gifts God has for us. So Jesus' first command to his early followers is to wait. Then let's pick up in verse 8. Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus told his disciples to wait so that they're prepared to receive the promise of the Father, the gift, the power of the Holy Spirit. To go back to my story about my birthday, if Chris on Thursday would have given me my gifts and to celebrate my birthday, and then I would have just stood there with my arms crossed and refused to receive them, that would have just been really pointless, right? He has these good gifts that I've been waiting to receive, but then I just refused to receive them. That wouldn't be very helpful. But instead, I had to open my arms to receive and to open the gifts. And I think this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. I need you to wait so that you are prepared to receive, that you have an open posture, open minds and open hands and open hearts to receive the powerful gift of the Holy Spirit. In the summer of 2005, my family and I took a trip to Mount Rushmore. And I remember driving up to Mount Rushmore and going to the visitor center to watch a video about how they carve uh, Mount Rushmore. And this is a picture of what the mountain looked like before the famous faces were carved into the rock. <coughs> and I remember learning that dynamite was a really key tool in the construction of Mount Rushmore. 
because the architects decided to use dynamite to blast off over 500,000 tons of stone that they referred to as the overburden that was excess stone that they weren't going to use to carve Mount Rushmore. So they blasted away all this stone to get to what Mount Rushmore looks like today, and they did that through dynamite. The book of Acts is originally written in Greek, and the word power, the Greek word for power, is dynamis. It's the same word in which we get our English word dynamite from. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to receive the dynamic, powerful, life-changing, purifying gift of the Holy Spirit. This is what the Father is giving you. You just need to receive it. So Jesus tells them to wait to receive the life-changing, dynamic power of the Holy Spirit so that from that place of receiving the power, they can be witnesses. Jesus tells his disciples to witness to his life, death, and resurrection and the difference that Jesus is making in his life to tell the world about the kingdom of God. And he tells them to start in Jerusalem, start in their home base where they currently were living and where they were planted. And then to go to Judea, the area surrounding Jerusalem. And then even to Samaria, the area surrounding Jerusalem that had a lot of people that the Jews didn't like. In fact, the Jews hated the Samaritans. But Jesus said, go there and tell them the good news about Jesus as well. And don't just stop there, but go to the ends of the earth. At the time of Jesus, when a new Roman emperor would come to power, the Roman emperor would send out people into the empire to tell everyone that a new king, a new ruler, had come to power. And Jesus is taking that same model but applying it to himself and his kingdom, the kingdom of God. And he's saying uh, to his disciples, I am sending you out as witnesses to go to the ends of the earth to tell every single person about the good news of Jesus, about the kingdom of God, about this life that I am offering you. Be my witnesses to tell the world, to tell the world that there's a new king in power and his name is Jesus. So the first command that Jesus gives his early followers is for them to wait, to receive, and to witness. And I think these commands still apply to us who seek to follow Jesus today, that we are to wait, to trust God's timeline and not our own, to trust that God has good gifts for us. But sometimes we can wait a little too long and kind of sit back and cross our arms and refuse to be ready and to be open to receive the powerful, dynamic gift of the Holy Spirit. That we need to be open for God's work in our life to receive that gift so that we can be witnesses to tell the world about Jesus and the difference Jesus has made in our lives. Because all of us have a story of the work Jesus has done in our lives. And some of you might be sitting there this morning thinking, well, you know what, Hannah, like, I grew up in the church. I never knew a time when I didn't know God, and so I don't really have a story, I don't really have a testimony of the difference Jesus has made in my life, but I challenge you to think about that this morning, because that was also my story. I grew up in the church, never really knew a time when I did know about God. I remember accepting and deciding to follow Jesus at a young age, I was like five years old, and then deciding in a more serious way when I was 12 years old, and then felt called to become a minister at the age of 16, and decided to go to Messiah College to study Christian ministries. And it was there, while I was at a Christian school, studying Christian theology, that for the first time in my life, I really started to doubt my faith. And I think what happened is I had this elementary faith that was handed to me from my parents, from the church in which I grew up in. But I had this elementary kind of baby, childlike faith that couldn't handle the adult, mature questions that I was asking. And all of a sudden, that faith began to crumble. And here I was at a Christian school studying Christian ministries, and I didn't know if I believed any of it anymore. And I remember wrestling with this and actually almost deciding to become an atheist because I didn't know if I believed any of it. And one night, I came to this one core belief that I was wrestling with. And I looked at the universe that we are a part of, and I still to this day remember thinking that there has to be a creator. I just couldn't fathom how we could live in this incredible universe if there wasn't a creator behind it. And from that basic belief, I began to kind of reconstruct 
my faith. And it became my own faith and my own decision to follow and believe Jesus. Not something that my parents told me, not something that the church had told me or my pastor had told me, but something that I had built and reconstructed and decided to follow after. And not too long after that, after Jesus saved me from that doubt, I began to experience a lot of fear. I felt called to be a minister, but I was terrified, terrified of public speaking. In fact, if you would have told me then that I would stand up on Sunday mornings and talk to people, I would have laughed in your face because I was terrified to speak in public. I would like to stand up and my voice would shake. And I remember Jesus continually to give me these opportunities to practice that skill, to grow in confidence, to overcome fear that Jesus was saving me from my fear. And then some of you know that I can sometimes be a bit of an anxious person. And uh, anxiety, I think, is something that many of us uh, struggle with in this culture. And uh, a couple months ago, I was on this run, and all these anxious thoughts were, like, swirling in my brain. And it was becoming so overwhelming that I had to stop running because it was just consuming me. And I knew in that moment, this is not the life God desires for me. This is not the abundant life Jesus came to offer us. And so I just cried out to God in that moment. I said, like, God, save me. And I still can't even describe to you what that moment was like, but it was like a burden had been lifted. It was literally like I could see the world differently, and I felt so much freer, and, and this life felt so much fuller in that moment. And Jesus, I believe, was delivering me from anxiety in that moment. And I tell you these stories this morning not to stand up here to somehow pretend that I have my life all together or that Jesus has saved and healed me from all these things. Because I don't always believe that's true. I believe conversion is not this one-time event, but it's this continual journey where Jesus is continually saving us and making us new and healing us and setting us free. But I tell you this story this morning because I believe there is hope and there is life in following Jesus. That Jesus has made a difference in my life, and I believe you have stories too where you have seen Jesus make a difference in your life. And we are to be witnesses of that, to tell the world about the good news of Jesus and the difference we've seen in Jesus. And actually, I'll go one step further to challenge you this morning that if you don't have a story of the difference Jesus has made in your life, I'm going to ask for you to consider if you're really following Jesus. Because I believe that following Jesus is a journey of transformation where we receive the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit, and that changes us from the inside out and makes us different people to make us more and more like Jesus. And so if you don't have a story of Jesus changing your life, making a difference in your life, then I want you to wonder and question, am I really a follower of Jesus? Because there is power in following Jesus. So this morning, I want to give us a chance to live into these three things. To wait and to trust God, but to not just stop at waiting, but to receive, to have an open posture to receive the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. And maybe some of us have never actually received that power in our lives. And so we haven't actually been witnesses to tell the world of the good news of Jesus and the difference he's made in our lives. So in just a few moments, I'm actually going to close by singing a song called Spirit and it's my hope that in this moment, this will become your prayer. That it could be an opportunity for you to have an open posture, to uncross your arms, and to receive the life-giving, dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. So let's use this time as a prayer to God as we open our arms to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit.
that we would be in your weaknesses. God, we need your power this morning. We need your healing. We need your forgiveness. We need your grace. And so, God, we cry out to you with open arms. We receive you. And God, I ask you to change us from the inside out, to give us 